Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to FYI, ARC's four-year innovation podcast. I'm joining you as your host, Tasha Keeney from ARC. I'm joined by my colleague, Pierce. And today we're interviewing Noah from Built Robotics. Noah, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tasha. Excited to be here. Great. We're happy to have you. So I think I think we'll start just by quickly introducing your company to our listeners. Um, you know, what do you do? Kind of what stage of the company life cycle are you at today? Sure. So I started Built Robotics in 2016. And the initial hypothesis was autonomy is coming, self-driving cars are going to be a thing, but it's going to take a little longer than people expect. And it's probably going to become commercialized in uh, more constrained environments first. And I really decided to focus on construction because it was an area I kind of knew. I had grown up around construction. My dad worked in construction when I was a kid and I, I worked for him in summers uh, during high school. And uh, I just knew there was a ton of labor out there that that uh, needed to get done uh, on job sites and there weren't the people to do it. So that was kind of the initial hypothesis. I think that's largely been borne out, actually. Um, if you look at you know, sort of the evolution of the self-driving car industry here and, you know, we've deployed now on a few dozen uh, construction projects um, around the U.S. and actually around the world uh, in Australia as well. And what we've really sort of zeroed in on, particularly in the last couple of years, is renewables and utility scale solar. So that's that's our big focus now as a company is basically developing autonomous uh, construction solutions for solar. Great. Yeah. And, you know, that certainly fits in with the work that we do here at ARC. We care a lot about autonomy and we've done a lot of work on the autonomous taxi space. And, you know, our, our top line conclusion there is that ultimately by taking the human out of the loop, you can make um, the machines have higher utilization rates, um, but you can also, of course, lower costs and um, that, you know, productivity gain that you get a- as a result of, of those two dynamics um, can can be pretty dramatic. So you 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 all build the, it's like a, a hardware system that, and a software system that you can retrofit onto existing machines, right? And then how does that get sold into customers? Because I know the construction industry has its own sort of unique dynamics here. No, you're, you're very uh, astute to point that out. Um, and the answer is we kind of are flexible. And, you know, like a lot of enterprise businesses, we sort of, you know, we adapt our go to market um, to fit the needs of our customer. So there's probably sort of two basic models and there's kind of, you know, a, a spectrum in between. The first is we just rent out what we call the exosystem. So that's that upgrade kit that you install on an off-the-shelf Caterpillar or John Deere or Komatsu um, piece of construction equipment. And we rent that out. And then we also charge a, that's the hardware fee. And then we also charge a software u- usage fee. And then those sort of two things combine together and create like a RAS model, um, a robot as a service model. That works really well for some customers. And then the other end of the spectrum is closer to almost being like a turnkey sort of service provider where we are training their folks, pretty involved, and then maybe even getting paid on a on like a, a piece rate effectively, you know, uh, or progress rate. Um, and that can work well. We've done more of that in Australia. And then we think that there's probably going to be a spectrum where, you know, as over time, we think more folks are going to gravitate toward that RAS model. But we think that, you know, every construction company is kind of at its own place in that journey. And, uh, you know, we're happy to meet customers where they are and, uh, you know, just do whatever needs to be done in order to get the work done. So what sort of like features made your systems particularly well suited to solar and renewables, as you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, so 
we have kind of our initial product that we've uh, launched and deployed on a bunch of different projects is an autonomous trenching solution. So what is a trench? It's a basically a long, skinny hole uh, in the ground. And you use trenches for buried infrastructure. Um, so, you know, pipes uh, for water, uh, wastewater, you know, for pipelines, you know, for gas or oil and water, and then also for uh, buried cable for telecom and for power. And it's really the the buried cable for power that's kind of as merged as the, the use case, the end use case that's just, uh, you know, the best fit for our technology. So you can imagine kind of where we are and the kind of work we're doing. You know, utility scale solar farms are just these massive, massive projects. So, you know, the biggest project we've been on was probably 20 miles by 10 miles, something like that. You know, you can get lost out there kind of in the desert and, you know, there's just nothing to see. And these cables uh, need to route sort of all over that project. And they're generally buried because for, actually because of a few reasons. It's kind of interesting to get into it. So the first is uh, it's safer. Um, the second is you actually improve the longevity of the project because you don't have the cable uh, get, uh, you know, you can't access the cable. And then the third one's really interesting is you actually can keep the cables cooler um, when they're underground. And the temperature of the cable really matters because as that cable's temperature goes up, the resist- resistivity of the copper goes up. Um, so you actually end up losing more of your power. So you want to have your cables buried where they're cool, safe, and then obviously where they're safe for for people who are maintaining the solar farm. So on that one project, there were over 100 miles of trench that needed to be installed. So just, you know, many, many, like if you were one person digging that trench, you would have been you would have been there for years. And so we kind of have developed a system where we have these excavators, which look like standard excavators, but they have the exosystem uh, that's sort of installed on the back. And they're tracking all over this job site and digging trenches um, and basically following the blueprints that they're given. So that was kind of our initial product. We've gotten really good traction. And the new product that we're developing is really based on uh, customer feedback. And what we heard from everybody was, hey, you know, the autonomous trenching is great. You know, the productivity is actually about where a human operator is now. Uh, The quality is good. Um, The reliability is, is, you know, where it needs to be. But digging a trench is, uh, is actually a pretty small slice of the pie in terms of uh, the overall cost and complexity of building a solar farm. And what we decided was we wanted to basically take on a bigger chunk of that work. And uh, the scope that we identified that we think is the best fit for our technology is what's called pile driving. So you imagine that solar farm again, and uh, you know you have cables underground um, you know, in the trenches, and then above ground, you have uh, what are called trackers you know, the, the solar technology, which really kind of become the, the dominant uh, design in the U.S., is what's called single axis trackers. So you have these rows of solar panels. The rows are always oriented north south. And what that uh, enables is that you can rotate the solar panels so they face east in the morning. And then throughout the day, they rotate and face west. So you have these, you know, hundreds of thousands of solar panels uh, that are all kind of arrayed on these trackers. And the trackers are themselves installed on piles. And a, a pile is a, is a, an I-beam, basically, that's been driven into the ground. And again, on one of this, you know, this one particular solar farm, uh, I think there are 300,000 piles that needed to get uh, installed. Um, so it's an incredibly repetitive work. And it's, a, it's very time consuming. It's also super loud. You know, if you're uh, on a piling crew, you have to wear double hearing protection. So in-ear and then over-ear hearing protection uh, because you, there's a real risk of hearing uh, loss. Um, and so we've we kind of identified that as, as a, you know, and, and that's that can be up to, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the cost of uh, building a solar farm. So we identified this as a really good place to focus um, and uh, we'll be launching that uh, this summer. So you've got file drivers, and excavators, you've got trenchers and then with the most recent acquisition of Rowan, I assume concrete laying equipment as well. Are there any other like construction equipment categories that you can claim to work in? Yeah, in the past, we actually uh, automated loaders as well, like skid steer loaders and CTLs. And then we've done a bunch of work with dozers uh, doing finished grading. And I think we've gotten to the point now where our technology is compatible with a wide variety of OEMs and types of equipment. And really, the, the thing that I think determines you know, scaling and success for us is less about the technology barriers and more about how do we make something that's easy and efficient for the customer. And uh, you know, that's where I think the, the pile driving is really going to stand out for our customers. And you mentioned that you know, the core solution that you started with, you're, you're, reaching, you're uh, matching productivity 
of a human. But, you know, I imagine that in in doing that, you're like reducing the labor demand on the job site. I guess, yeah, what is what is that as we think of like, you know, the cost savings, like productivity enhancements that you all bring? how, How should we think of that equation? Like maybe you know, by technology or broadly now that you're sort of handling different areas of of tasks here? Maybe I can use California as a specific example. We're based in San Francisco. We've done a lot of work in California. Everybody's heard the cost of living is very high in California and uh, wages are very high as well. So if you're a skilled uh, equipment operator, the negotiated union rate um, uh, for you, including wages and fringe benefits and everything else, is I believe at $93 an hour, something like that. Uh, it varies a little bit between uh, NorCal and SoCal. And then good operators uh, in the labor shortage kind of environment that we're in, good operators are actually even paid over scale, so above that. And then that's not including overtime. So to uh, kind of turn that into a cost per year, a good operator can cost over $200,000 a year. And then on top of that, uh, you generally have an operator who's paired with a spotter. So you have an operator uh, who's running the equipment and a spotter who's kind of working around the, the operator and giving them you know, hand signals to let them know when they're going too deep or if they're about to hit anything. Um, and you have this team. So the, the cost of running uh, sort of a production excavator on a, on a large solar farm can be uh, you know, close to three or $400,000 a year in California from a labor standpoint. So there's a significant economic incentive for our, our customers to try to you know, bring some technology to bear here. The other piece, though, which I always highlight is that you just can't find the operators. You know, the average age of an equipment operator is almost 50 years old now, um, and it tends to be trending up over time. Uh, So you just don't have the folks who are joining the industry. And, you know, digging a trench is important. There's a ton of trench that has to go into a solar farm, but it's not the most sort of, you know, high touch skilled uh, type of equipment operating. So generally, if you need to do, you know, you want to have your skilled human operators on those tricky bits where you maybe, you know, you need to do some rework and you're digging around cables or, you know, you're in among the arrays, um, you know, that type of work is the more complex work where you'd like to allocate your human labor. So that gives you maybe a little bit of a sense for the kind of numbers we're talking about here. So as you mentioned, spotters, like kind of brings up in a, a thought we were having earlier, which is like when you're digging in all these dynamic environments, different soil textures and compositions, and like you have to worry about obstacles underground and things like that, like, I imagine you have a significant sensor suite you have to retrofit each of these with. And so like, could you tell us a little more about those sensors and, and how it looks, what it looks like to, to install them and also what kinds they are? So we have, I would say, a pretty similar sensor suite compared with a lot of the self-driving car projects out there. The sort of core of it is, uh, you know, this liquid-cooled mil-spec computer. So it's a really rugged computer. It's installed in, like, tanks and helicopters and stuff. And we've got some uh, pretty robust uh, NVIDIA GPUs in there. Then uh, we have uh, cameras. Um, uh, We use a bunch of different monocular RGB cameras uh, currently. Um, we actually don't have LiDAR on the system. We, we did in the past, but we don't currently. We've run into a lot of issues with ruggedness uh, in the construction environment um, relating to LiDAR. Then we have GPS, and we use RTK GPS. So it's basically an augmented GPS that takes your accuracy from a couple meters down to about a centimeter. Um, so it's this really, really uh, accurate GPS, which is really cool. And then we use IMUs, uh, inertial measurement units, um, and we use those all over the system to basically measure angles and the acceleration of different uh, parts of the machine. And that's kind of the core sensor suite. Got it. And you said that, you know, you don't think that technology is a a barrier. So would you say that like the autonomy for what you need it to do is like pretty much a solved problem? And I guess like how much, you know, it seems like as you deploy more and more of your solutions, you should be able to sort of learn from those deployments and you get all that great machine vision data. Yeah, what does that trajectory look like over time? Or is there one? I mean, solve problem, I think, is maybe a little bit of a stronger word. I think we've managed to solve it, but it's taken you know a tremendous amount of effort over the last you know six and a half years here. And I also would say, too, that you know, I, I've gotten to the point now where given a new task, I feel like we can extend our platform, you know, this hardware platform, software platform that we've developed in order to enable that task. But it takes some time, you know, it can take, you know, up to maybe a year of R&D kind of focused on basically extending our current technology to encompass that. So we're not really at the point 
quite yet where we can just sort of like make an API call to a robot and then it can, you know, do some task that it's never been, uh, you know, used for in, uh, before in the past. So, and I think we're going to kind of be in that place for a little while. And, you know, that little while could be, you know, years or even decades. But I think that what's maybe what I was kind of trying to say before is that I think we're at the point now where the tech works and the challenge is more about uh, getting folks to embrace the tech and make it work for them and kind of within their um within their organizations, within their sort of like standard means and methods. Um, that's, I think, the the big focus for us. So we're spending a lot of time on training. Um, we have a partnership with the union, actually, the IUOE, the International Union of Operating Engineers. And uh, we're developing some curriculum with them to actually train operators to learn how to become robot equipment operators um, so, or REOs. So that's, that's a big focus. And then also just working with our customers to really identify, hey, you know, this is a task that we're spending a ton of time on, or maybe we're having some issues with safety or rework. And, uh, you know, we, you know, our customers would like to uh, basically explore autonomy for those, those particular tasks. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the stage that we're at now. You asked about, like, where does this thing go? You know, where's the trajectory? Um, I think that, you know, if you, you know, think back into previous decades or, you know, previous sort of eras in construction, we've kind of been able to do almost everything that we can do today for a long time. You know, like, you know, the first skyscrapers going up in the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? And they're not fundamentally that, that different from uh, the kinds of things that we can build today. What I think is different is, uh, first of all, it's a lot safer. You know, we have, all, you know, construction still is a dangerous industry, but it's far less dangerous than it used to be. And the second thing is that we do use uh, equipment, you know, all over the place. So if you see a, you know, a, a job site today, you see hydraulic equipment everywhere, you know, uh, and if it's not, and also battery operated equipment everywhere. So those are kind of your, your two main modalities for getting work done. Whereas in the past, you know, maybe it was steam or maybe it was even, you know, mules or, or men who were just, you know, hauling on ropes or whatever needed to get done. Right. And so I think that all of those places that you see hydraulic equipment today, those are going to start to be yeah, still, it'll still be hydraulic equipment, but rather than it being operated by a person, it'll be operated by a computer. Um, and so I think that's what's going to kind of change. And that's how the, the construction industry is going to evolve over the next, you know, 10, 20 years here. Yeah. So speaking of safety, I mean, how exactly do you, do you I mean, we, we've heard about your eight layer safety system that you guys integrate, kind of like working as like a stack of Swiss cheese, where some parts are kind of holy, but like if you line them all up on top of each other, you can't get through. Like, uh, what kind of things are you looking for in, in your eight layer safety system? And then, and then how do you expect that the safety will be, will be regulated for robots in the future? Yeah. And I should, I should, yeah, we do, we do reference the Swiss cheese model. I also should reference, or I shouldn't mention, you know, for the audience that, uh, we didn't come up with the Swiss cheese model. That's actually a, a sort of standard model. I think it was originally maybe from aircraft safety. So it is a, you know, it sounds a little silly, but it's actually a, you know, broadly accepted sort of way of thinking about safety and essentially just having contingency plans and trying to have uncorrelated, um, safety, uh, solutions so that if one of them fails, then, you know, not everything does. And yeah, we have an, an eight layer safety system. Let me see if I can recite them all. So we have, uh, it starts off with basically a, a constrained environment. So, you know, we put up a safety barrier around uh, where the robot's working, and that tells people to, to sort of stay outside of where the robot's working. And frankly, that's the most important one. You know, people are, are pretty smart, and the main thing is making sure they have the knowledge so that they can make smart decisions. The second thing is the geofence. So that's basically telling the robot, hey, stay inside the safety barrier. And, uh, you know, that's obviously important to, get to separate the robots from the people. Then the third is uh, signals uh, that basically tell people who are working alongside the robot when it's actually in autonomous mode. Um, so we have uh, these blue lights that are on and, and they're solid all the time. If the computer system's on, basically if the exosystem's on, and then they start to flash. Um, and there's a, there's a fast beeping sound when the robot's actually operating autonomously. And that's kind of another, you know, warning sign that like, hey, you know, the robot's actually doing stuff right now. It's not just, you know, sort of sitting there um, and you, you should stay away. Then the, uh, the fourth one here is uh, we have uh, cameras, you know, that can detect people and basically decide, hey, you know, somebody's coming up close to the robot, um, therefore it should stop. We also have uh, basically a bunch of like uh, health monitors for the robot. 
So it can tell if, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's starting to tip over because it's on a very steep slope or, you know, maybe there's like an engine fault um, or hydraulic leak. And, uh, you know, it can tell all of those things and you know, shut itself off and stop. And then uh, we also have a system we call Guardian, where we actually have our own folks. We work with a third party company, but we have our own sort of folks that we've trained who are constantly monitoring the robots all the time. And uh, they're almost kind of like, you know, folks who are monitoring like a closed circuit TV system. And uh, they're providing another sort of set of eyes and ears. Then let's see. The last piece, I think, is we have uh, uh, signs that you basically put up around. And again, it's all about just educating people and making sure they know that, hey, there's actually a robot here, an autonomous machine, and it's uh, working by itself. That might have been all of them. I think so. And so the, the important thing here is that, again, you know, it's knowledge. We need to make sure that folks understand that there is, uh, you know, a robot here. And, you know, we will, you know, every time we deploy a robot to a new job site, we actually do an announcement, you know, to the, to the whole, you know, everybody on the, uh, the site crew, um, you know, typically folks have like toolbox talks, or they maybe do like a, an all hands basically, you know, on Mondays or something. So we think that's really important. And then the other piece is, uh, you know, basically making sure the robot doesn't overextend itself. You know, we don't want it to go outside the geofence. We don't want it to keep on operating when there's any kind of a hardware issue uh, with the system. And if you can kind of do those two things, then then we think we can actually create a pretty safe system. And, you know, very proud that we've operated for tens of thousands of hours now with zero uh, robot-related safety incidents um, from our technology. And I think that one of the big things that's different about uh, construction autonomy compared with self-driving cars is that we're operating, you know, on private land and we're operating in a place where you actually can put the robot basically, you know, in a, in a constrained zone right there, a work zone. And that makes it a lot easier for us to, to ship a system, which is safe versus having, you know, cars that are, you know, dri- driving on public roads with, you know, varying conditions, uh, and people who, you know, pedestrians who might jaywalk right in front of the car or whatever. Um, so we think that's one of the big things that's enabled us to accelerate, uh, you know, uh, commercialization here. When you set a sort of constrained barrier around where the robot operates, and it, so- it sounds like it has a system in place and sensors to detect when someone's coming, but the idea is for people to sort of stay away while it's in the autonomous mode. So does that mean that, like, theoretically, the machines could operate a lot faster than they do today, or is that not how it works? I'm thinking of like, you know, in, in factories, robots that are the non-collaborative kind that are sort of chained off tend to move like incredibly quickly. And or, or does it not work the same way in a construction site? We're generally maxing out the capabilities of the machine. You know, we're, we're opening up the hydraulic valves as far as they go and basically moving the machine as quickly as it can go. And the reason for that is that, you know, the machines are kind of designed to be operated by humans. So it's actually a pretty interesting question. Like, hey, what if they don't need to be operated by humans? And, you know, can they move more quickly or can they, you know, can some of the, um, the control systems actually start to change? I think the answer is yes. But uh, we've decided to really stick with partnering with, you know, the sort of biggest construction equipment OEMs um, rather than trying to develop something ourselves. Just because, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants here. You know, this equipment's been sort of battle tested and proven on job sites around the world over decades now. So thinking ahead, will, you know, some sort of dedicated autonomous equipment be uh, created? I think absolutely. But I think, you know, we want to take our time uh, in order to get there. So, I mean, you're pushing this like REO exosystem paradigm where where you've got one guy who's ostensibly operating like possibly a fleet of different pieces of equipment. And so you could like go and like, give a robot a task at one site and then drive over to a different site, give that one a task. Like how present does he need to be at every site to supervise? And, and also, I guess what we're ultimately trying to ask is when can humans be completely taken out of the loop? Or is that even something that's on the, the radar for you guys? So I guess to answer the last question, it's, it's not even on the radar for us. And the reason for it is that there's just this work that needs to be done, this sort of peripheral to the core autonomy. And, you know, that's things like fueling the machine. It's like setting up that that safety barrier. It's talking to other crews on the job site and making sure that they're ready for trench to go on the ground. So that kind of like human collaboration, we think, is always going to be there. But, yeah, you might have one REO who's operating a handful of machines and getting this incredible speed up, um, basically, as a result, uh, you know, for for the, the productivity and for his employer. And probably the, the way to think about it is maybe like in a machine shop where you have a bunch of CNC machines 
um, which are actually like these highly uh, automated, you know, sort of robotic machines. Um, but you still have one person who's generally tending, uh, you know, a handful of machines. And we think that that kind of uh, that that mode of of working with robots extends pretty well to construction as well. So I mean, like in CNC machining, like, like sure, like when you set the thing off on its job, it it can be you know fairly set and forget. But I think that there's a lot of skill that goes into the design of the of the toolpath and all of that. So in the same way, is is there like how much skill is there involved in giving the equipment that the exosystem its tasks? Because I know you have your own software, um, and I, you've you've said it, it's quite intuitive. But I mean, is it pretty basic, or is it like a better operator for that software is going to get a significantly better result than somebody who's more new to it? I think the one of the things that's, I guess, is kind of interesting about you know our work is that we don't have that much control over what gets done. You know, that's sort of handed to us from the site engineers who are actually designing this overall. You know, it's electrical engineers, civil engineers who are designing this overall solar farm. And uh, the so, you know, it's it, essentially like it's it's almost like it's such a tight specification that there's not that much room for variation. Where I think the really skilled REOs uh, shine, though, is uh, about utilization. So how do you keep the machine running and how do you think, you know, one step ahead, two steps ahead, you know, make sure that there's, you know, construction, uh, there's often conflicts where, you know, you have a, you know, maybe the electrical crew is trying to put in, uh, you know, buried cable. And then you have a mechanical crew that's actually trying to like stage a bunch of piles for install, right? You know, these two crews can often kind of conflict and like, you know, you have to get a superintendent or a foreman out there and figure out who's kind of going to have precedence. So that type of like thinking ahead and making sure that there's no conflicts throughout the whole critical path that this robot's working on, that is, I think, where people really shine. And that then you just end up going from, you know, maybe, you know, six hours or something of productive digging. And if you're not doing a great job or you can get, you know, eight or nine or 10 hours of productive digging uh, if you are doing a really good job managing the robot and managing the other crews around the robot. Yeah. So, I mean, you'd mentioned how much it costs to hire an operator in California, at least for, you know, per year. But I mean, like, have you done any studies that, it, that look at the, the rate of equipment utilization relative to human, like, you know, because humans need to take breaks and you do this or that, you know, I mean, like if you're, if you're designing a, a path or a task for the for the robot, essentially, then like how much more efficiently can it accomplish the work and how many fewer hours are you required to rent the equipment for or, you know, use the equipment for to get the same amount of work done? Have you done any like studies into that? Yeah, I mean, typically you're going to have two 15 minute breaks and a 30 minute break over the course of a crew if you're an operator. And then plus you're going to have times where you're not necessarily on break, but you're just kind of, you know, you're not sure what to do or you're waiting and the robot just works through all of it. So, you know, that's kind of a minimum like 10% speed up in a 10 hour shift. And uh, yeah, when we've seen that, you know, we, I think the, probably the longest uninterrupted streaks that we've had are close to 14 hours. Um, and the way we've done that is actually is we even let the robot run later than the, than the human operator would. And that's, you know, something that's viable because the REOs have other activities that they can do. They also, they can, you know, this is typically something we've done in Australia where we have these, you know, super, super distributed sites. And there's kind of like a work camp um, where people stay. And so we can even have the REO kind of based out of the work camp. And then they kind of only, you know, drive out to the robot at the very end of the day when it's getting dark in order to turn it off. So, yeah, we've gotten, you know, really nice speed ups uh, and uh, efficiency gains there. Yeah, theoretically, could you run this? 24 seven. I mean, I'm assuming, you know, now it's, it's coming in stages and, you know, as, as you said, there still needs to be a human in the loop for giving instructions. Um, of course you have humans in the background monitoring, but could it be an all night continuation? Yeah. I mentioned there that the REO would drive out and turn it off at night. The reason for that is actually just because we don't want to bo bother the ranchers who, you know, probably are never going to go there, but Technically, like this is their land and we want to you know, be respectful of them. But um, we have gotten permission on a few projects to do kind of like basically tests where we do like, you know, 24 hours of operation or 36 hours of operation or whatever. And yeah, we've I mean, we've gotten like basically like, you know, in one 24 hour shift, we've done three times the work of a typical 10 hour shift. Um, and the reason for that is you just don't have the same kind of stop start, you know, uh, you know, stuff to do every morning. 
Um, so yeah, we've had really good results from a handful of uh, 24 hour tests we've done or overnight tests. Okay. And, you know, you've added these capabilities through Rowan, you know, this new product that you're the, the piling um, system that, that you have coming out is, is your goal to sort of own the own autonomy within specific job sites? You know, you partner with the machine makers, like, could you imagine, it seems like your company would be pretty attractive as an acquisition target one day. Is that what you want? Sort of what's the future that you you want? What do you want Built's ultimate sort of mission to be? I'd like to build a, you know, an independent company that stands the test of time. And there's a couple companies that I think we look to. I mean, there's recent companies, I think SpaceX is, you know, every nerd loves SpaceX, right? And we certainly look to them and, you know, we, uh, admire that, you know, they stayed private, they're working on these incredibly difficult technical problems, and then they're building a real business at the same time. So I think that that's kind of the, you know, the the, uh, pattern that we'd like to follow. There's also a construction company that a lot of people don't know, but it's called Letourneau. And they were kind of the caterpillar of like the mid 20th century. Um, I want to say they probably had like 60, 70% market share in the US in like the 1950s and 60s. And they eventually, I think, got acquired by Joy Global and then Komatsu, uh, Japanese OEM, now owns them. The cool thing about them, though, is that they always, they're, they're sort of their heritage was that they actually were a contractor and they were deploying their own equipment on job sites. And they were just getting this incredible, basically, um, advantage. Um, and uh, that was how they sort of like really proved that their tech worked um, and sort of was able to like, they, they were they were basically the ones who were really able to get folks to understand that, you know, hydraulic equipment was the way to do large scale earth moving. This was in like the early 20th century. Um, and uh, that sort of like, uh, that's always, I found that really inspiring. Um, this idea of just like going out there, deploying the, the robots and then like, uh, you know, making sure that they work and like learning from them. That's, I would say we've tried to follow that ourselves. So, you know, I'll, I'll go out to uh, deployments, you know, pretty often every couple of weeks, usually, you know, a lot of our engineering team does too. And uh, I think that trajectory of basically like going out to the place that the robots are actually used and, you know, making sure you're not kind of locked in an ivory tower or locked in an R&D lab. That I, th- I find super inspiring. It's what we, we've always tried to follow. So, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, I, I think there's just so much to do. If you look at, like, construction, it's about, you know, one and a half trillion almost in the U.S. Uh, as a sector. You know, it's a huge number of, uh, you know, folks that are employed, uh, just a huge amount of spend. If you look at everybody's share of wallet, you know, you know their mortgage, their rent tends to be the highest. So I think there's this, this incredible amount of construction that needs to get done. And I think autonomy is going to be a, a really big lever for us as a society to you know, get people better, better constructed, better built world uh, infrastructure um, at, a, at a better price. Too. Would you eventually want your system to be um, factory integrated, sort of yes, built, built, purposely built onto machines? OK, yeah, because it seems like right now you know, you sort of, you need to go after this aftermarket solution. I mean, that's even what we see the other construction operators that are working on pieces of autonomy doing themselves because of the way that product life cycle works. But eventually you think it could all yes. be integrated. Yeah. And, and uh, you can tell them like, I like history and I like looking at like, you know, patterns from sort of previous eras. Something that I compare our sort of trajectory to is actually steam ships, um, paddle wheel steamers. You know, for a very long time, ships actually would have sails and then also steam engines and uh, and paddle wheels on them, right? That was kind of the standard way of making ships for, you know, a period of decades. And uh, it looks kind of silly. Like, it looks it looks super silly, actually, now, if you look at some of these photos. Um, it's like, why did they need this? But it's because, like, sails were this trusted technology. The ships had already been designed. In many cases, they'd already been manufactured. You know, ships super expensive. It's not like you're going to go make a new one, right? They're going to retrofit it. Um, or, or you would make new one and you'd, you'd want to have both capabilities. And so I think we're kind of in that same period now in, in uh, autonomy and in construction equipment. So I think that you're going to have, you know, for the next, you know, 10 plus years, you're going to have, you know, excavator that's got a cabinet and joysticks and, you know, you can put a guy in there and, you know, that you can operate it sort of the old fashioned way. But then over time, right, you get to the point where we have purpose built, dedicated, uh, autonomous construction equipment as well. Yeah, that reminds me of um, it's like the transition from the horse to the automobile. There was there was some similar things going on. It, it's like you had a you know semi automated machine, but it was still being pulled by a horse, and it did look silly. But I guess that's that's what happened in the interim. Yeah, exactly. 
do you think that in terms of the com- components that you need for autonomy, is that always going to be off the shelf? You know, I see some of the autonomous car companies going after it. Well, I guess some of the companies that are using LiDAR at least want to bring that in-house. I know you're not using that, so not relevant here. But like in terms of, um, you know, like the sensors that you need or perhaps the hardware that you're using for inference, would that always be just partnering with outside providers? I think so. And I, I think it's, you know, if you're Google Waymo, like maybe you have the budget where it starts to make sense for you to just like try to spin up your own like LiDAR uh, division, basically. Um, but arguably, I'm not, I'm not even sure if it really makes sense for Waymo, but I think that it, it does not make sense for us, you know, at, at our scale and, you know, sort of with our uh, financials. So, and, and I think that, you know, a question that is always important to ask is like, why now? Like, what is the thing that's enabling, you know, your your startup uh, and, you know, to be successful now? And it's an important question because if there's not a good why now, then like maybe it's not like a good startup idea, right? Um, and I think that the answer for us is that there's just so many pieces of technology that didn't exist, you know, five or 10 years ago that we're now uh, counting on. And, you know, it's the cameras, it's the algorithms, it's the GPUs, the CPUs, it's the even the IMU sensors, um, you know, all of these things are kind of, you know, really uh, uh, the self-driving car industry, I think, is propelling a lot of it. But it's it's beyond that, too. You know, it's even just the, you know, the continued improvement in from you know, cell phones and, you know, and obviously all the research that's being done in ML. Um, all of that, I think, is blending together to basically give us the, the point now where all the Lego pieces are kind of out there. And then we're really much more of like a systems engineering kind of company where we're taking them all, gluing them together, you know, creating good architecture, creating good UI. And that's how we're, and that's how we're adding value for the customer. So like, as you become more and more competent at doing this kind of systems engineering, do you expect that like, you know, sister fields like agriculture or things like that will become more easily accessible to you or or do you expect you're kind of, kind of going to remain within construction? Like, how do you see that looking? I think yes is the is the short answer. You know, a lot of the equipment is fundamentally similar, and the tasks are not that different either. But I think that the economics are pretty different, uh, particularly between agriculture and construction. And you know, there's this uh, I think a McKinsey study that was done a couple of years ago that basically looked at the labor productivity in different sectors of the economy, and the number one improvement in since World War II was actually agriculture. You know, the uh, we have these giant uh, tractors and combines. We have GMO crops. Um, you know, we have you know improved irrigation system. You know, you know all, all different kinds of things. And so the the effect is that it just takes so little labor now to create food um, that very very few people are employed. Um, and you know, I was we were actually on a wind farm project for a few months, and the wind farm was uh, situated you know sort of within a corn farm in Kansas, and. Uh, I was talking to some of the guys who worked there and it was like a 500 acre farm that had three people who worked there. You know, it's like, there's just, there's so little labor that's required in order to do this work now. And if you look at construction, construction's this kind of crazy, you know, basically like it's the opposite where instead of it being more efficient, you know, compared to the World War II, it's actually less efficient now where it takes more people to sort of create the same amount of, you know, if you want to, you want to go build another like Empire State Building, it's going to take you more people and more time. And would you say that's because of safety constrictions or, or restrictions or or why would you say that is exactly? I think that that's part of it. I think that other regulations are part of it, too, in terms of just, you know, zoning and environmental and things like that. But I think that the biggest reason for it is that the cost of living has just continued to go up. And so you have to pay those wages in order to attract people into the industry. And the means and methods haven't really changed. It's kind of like what I was saying before is that, you know, the, the things that we can build haven't really changed that much. And, you know, the biggest, I, I would say that probably the biggest innovations are like, yeah, battery operated, like handheld equipment and then hydraulic equipment. Um, so you just haven't had the same sort of like improvements that you've seen uh, in agriculture and, and in manufacturing and other sectors. So, you know, to answer your question, you know, will we sort of look at some of these adjacent sectors? I think we will. And, and we have to some extent. But I think that the sort of there's this incredible pent up need in construction, which I think sets it apart um, really from from every other sector uh, out there. And, you know, in, in the passenger car space, when you like the, the data stream that you get off of collecting images and, and video really helps you solve all these corner cases. And it's, it's this huge asset. And I, I imagine that it is for you as well. 
but it must it must be it's it's slightly different because you don't you don't have those surprise factors that you talked about where you would with like an on road system. Do you think that it's in your case it's more like this? You know, helps me one have like these proof points to help with the adoption of the technology, but maybe also expand into other tasks. Or does that how, how do you how do you think of that asset that you're building? Yeah, I think that it's it, I would say it's tremendously useful for us. Mainly in the sense that, uh, like, it's not necessarily that we're like running all of this da- this whole data set through some like machine learning like you know training process, but it's more that we just have hit all of these things and we've kind of like baked them into our system, all these different edge cases and, and challenges. So I think it's more of like a traditional way of valuing that asset, where you know if you've just done a bunch of trials and you've deployed it a bunch, you're going to have a better system versus the self-driving cars. But that said, I mean, we still have, you know, I, I want to say a couple million uh, different uh, images that we've you know, collected from a bunch of different job sites. And we, you know, we do sort of feed them all through our machine learning models and, you know, we back test on it. And so that's that's helpful, too. But I think that it, because of construction being a more constrained environment, yeah, you don't have to worry quite as much about that. Or another way of saying is that, you know, we can have a machine learning system that's basically tuned to like what's expected. And if anything deviates from that, then like, oh, wow, we got to stop, right? That's that's one of our uh, triggers in our eight-layer safety system. Whereas in you know self-driving cars and public roads, you can't be that conservative or you're going to have way too many false positives. Um, so it's a different way of architecting it. We are in this kind of golden age of AI and machine learning where we're seeing all these crazy advancements, you know, chat GPT. And it seems like some of that like it has to be somewhat pervasive and like make its way into other fields. And what, what we're initially seeing now, like you could imagine, you know, you're getting like some sort of voice input into, uh, you know, a, a machine that wasn't really possible before. And I've also seen that, you know, Tesla's using um, transformers to basically predict where lanes are as you, as the car is approaching before it sort of understand, can actually see what's happening. So I'm just curious, like um, what, what types of AI you're using today and have any of those advances helped you as you know, you've built your, the company. So we really use machine learning for uh, perception, you know, for computer vision, basically. Um, And yeah, we definitely are continuing to see advancements there. You know, one of uh, sort of like, you know, a lot of people are focused more on things like language models, especially with ChatGPT over the last couple of months. And I think there's a bit of a perception in academia anyway that like uh, computer vision is kind of a solved problem from a machine learning standpoint. That's not how I think about it. And the reason is like, it's just how many nines do you want, right? And it's fine if you maybe only want like, you know, 90% accuracy, then yeah, sure. You know, computer vision is a solved problem. But, you know, 90% is not good enough in an actual commercial application where safety is on the line, right? You need like, five nines or six nines or something. That's what we're, we're really focused on is really how do we refine our machine learning model in order to get us that many nines um, and do it without introducing these false positives. So I would say that we're not necessarily using like maybe the, you know, chat GPT is not a part of our system, at least not yet. But I do think that uh, there are, we've, we've been conti- continuing to benefit from advancements in the sort of machine learning field. And yeah, it's absolutely one of the things that enables this uh, this technology to work today. Maybe one last thing on my mind, I don't know if we have time, but uh, worth exploring a little bit about uh, why we're focused so much on solar today. And I think, you know, the transition to, to solar is, you know, uh, you know, something that we need as a society. And the other thing, though, that I think is really cool is the IRA, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act that, uh, you know, was passed last summer. I think it's meaningfully shaped, like, the construction industry. And a lot of different EPCs, these sort of large engineering procurement construction companies, have sort of refocused their business around solar because of the IRA. And so we, we've seen that too. And, you know, a lot of, uh, I think in 2022, something like 15 or 16 gigawatts of uh, utility scale solar was installed in the U.S. People are now projecting that by 2030, it's going to be like 120 gigawatts or something. So we're going to see almost an order of magnitude increase. And a lot of that is actually due to the IRA. So, you know, I tend to probably be more on the side of like, you know, we don't necessarily want a ton of like government intervention in a lot of industries. But I think that the IRA is actually, to me, it's it's just a fantastic move. I think that the fact that we are finally focusing, we have the budget to actually spend on transitioning to renewable energy, I think is pretty cool. And so that's, and it's, you know, meaningfully changed our strategy as a company. 
so that's why, you know, you, you think in, in your next generation product, you're focused on this area. It's like, it's becoming more important for that reason. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that, you know, when you're making decisions at the board level, like you, you're looking a lot at like TAM, like your total addressable market and the fact that the solar industry is growing so fast and, you know, will continue to grow so fast is basically lets us sort of make a financially responsible, uh, dedicated bet to solar, um, which is what we're doing now. Great. And what's next? I mean, as, as we, you know, we have a few minutes left here as, as we're wrapping up, what, what are you, what are you most excited about? What should we, you know, as, as uh, students of innovation be looking out for, for you all? So I think that, you know, with our autonomous trenching solution and then our autonomous piling solution, that'll let us actually take a, you know, big chunk of solar and, you know, put it into our system and, you know, our robots can actually help uh, in a big way, you know, build a utility scale solar farm. But I think there's actually even more for us to do too. So, you know, we're starting to think a little bit about uh, material management on the site and, you know, moving material around. It's a big challenge because you have, you know, just like 18 wheelers all day long that are coming in and delivering parts and components. And then it needs to all get sort of distributed across this massive site. So that's a focus for us. And then actually handling the modules themselves, so the solar panels themselves, and getting those in position to be installed on the trackers. So that's another big focus for us too. So yeah, I think really, I also should say too, I think that solar is an exciting place for us because it's growing so fast and you know the IRA and, and everything that's powering that. But it's also, it's a sector of the industry, which is uh, new, um, you know, the I was talking to somebody recently who worked on the largest solar farm in the world, or sorry, in the U.S. Uh, a few years ago. It was like a five megawatt solar farm. And to give you some sense, like the biggest solar farm in the U.S. now is, is over a gigawatt. So like, you know, 200 times that. And it's only in like a decade. So it's just it's this it's this sector that's developing so quickly that I think people are really excited and open to embracing uh, automation, too. Um, so, yeah, basically doubling down on solar and, you know, looking at all the different ways we can help. And does... I guess because of its newness, does it give autonomy kind of more of a chance because you're reconsidering the job? It's a new job site. Yes, absolutely. And there's less. Yeah, I would say that there are the people are definitely kind of, you know, hey, this is how we've built solar farms for the last five years. So, like, you know, we don't want to change that much. But it's, it's a lot easier saying, hey, this is how we've done it for the last five years. than this is how we built, you know, apartment buildings for the last 50 years. Right. So the people are, are, the ruts are not as deep, I would say, in terms of how people uh, like to operate. And solar is also, it's, if you go to a solar farm, it almost looks like a fractal, right? It's like this sort of uh, system that's, you know, very simple uh, and then just stamped out, you know, a million times, you know, over many, many acres. And that, that also, I would say, is conducive to autonomy because, uh, you know, robots are great at repetitive work. That makes sense. Well, Noah, thank you so much for enlightening us today. We learned so much about Bill Robotics and all the exciting things you're working on. We're excited to see um, you know, product. And I uh, think thanks for sharing it with us today. Um, sounds like there's a lot of exciting developments happening in the solar space. So definitely something for our listeners to, to watch and, and look for. Well, I, you know, I'd like to thank you for coming on the ARK Invest podcast. And uh, I, hope, I hope we continue the conversation in the future. This has been great. Thank you, Tasha. Yeah, thanks, Pierce. Appreciate you guys making that time. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.